with that, I'm really eager to hand this panel over uh, to the good hands of Erin Leverett, who is a senior scientist with Airbus, uh, has done lots of R&D about cyber risk, insurance, and digital forensics and incident response, and who in first is probably most well known for court chairing the insurance SIG and the EPSS SIG. So with that, Erin, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, and likewise, I'm super excited to introduce to you this panel. Um, putting it bluntly, the, the work that I will present with Matilda was inspired by the two pieces of work that you'll see come after our presentation. Um, we've also just been informed that we have a little bit more time for this panel than we expected. So we each have prepared uh, 10 minutes of content. It might be a little bit more now, which is great, um, on three different papers um, that really capture quantitative cyber risk in unique and interesting ways. And I think very practical ways that incident responders can use. So um, without further ado, ado I'll, I'll get us started um, and uh, introduce you to the broad topic. So the core of today's question will be how can we reduce uncertainty about upcoming vulnerabilities and exploitation? And the goal here was really to get predictive about these different things, not, not just to um, be reactive and think about how these things will affect us once we have more information, but how much can we learn from the data in advance of an attack? Um, so here are your panelists. I give you their uh, Twitter accounts so that you can follow them and tweet along and, and get involved. Um, I certainly follow each of these people for obvious reasons. And, you know, the keep calm and pay attention, I mean it. Right, we're going to try and go through an academic paper in 10 minutes, and then another one in 10 minutes, and then another one in 10 minutes. And if I'm really honest, not all of these are just a single ap academic paper. Like Jay and Sasha are going to present EPSS, um, which they've been working on for quite a long time and lots of ongoing work. And Luca too has many more papers to his name. So um, pay attention. We won't waste your time. We won't fill it with a lot of this nonsense. So moving on. So. We're talking about vulnerability-centric risk quantification today. There's a lot of ways we can frame cyber risk, um, but we wanna focus on the vulnerability and its journey, right? How many vulnerabilities will come out next year? How many of those uh, will have exploits written? And which ones will eventually be exploited in, in the wild? And how heavy might that exploitation be? That's all of the topics that we'll talk about today. Um, and not any, you know, any vulnerability that you can think of, I, I think of this as like a sort of eigen vulnerability. Let's say there's a vulnerability coming out next week. We don't know anything about it. How much could we learn by looking at other vulnerabilities? And I think that's a useful frame for this uh, conversation today. And the point is that not all vulnerabilities or exploits are created equal. Um, they're not equally exploited. All of the distributions that you'll see here today are pretty awesome and extreme. So if you like vulnerability nerd stuff, here we go. Um, so. Let's get started. The first project that we're talking about is, is vulnerability forecast. Matilda and I uh, have been working on this for about a year. Um, there's still more work to be done. And the gist of it is, can we predict the volume of vulnerabilities that will come out in the coming year? Um, so I'll turn it over to Matilda, who's been the best science and lab partner over the last year to get us started on this particular topic. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so yeah, so we can start um, just by looking at the data. So the goal of this project um, was uh, to see if we could predict um, the number of CVEs that might be coming out in the next month, the next six months, the next 12 months even, um, and then also dig deeper into whether we could predict uh, particular subsets of CVEs. So on the left hand side, you can see um, a graph just giving you the total number of CVEs that we've seen in the um, National Vulnerability Database um, since from 2002 to 2020. Um, and as you can see, there's this huge uh, jump around 2017. And it would be very useful for um, a lot of people if they could um, uh, predict these numbers as a kind of weather vane of how many vulnerabilities to expect um, in, in the upcoming year, particularly uh, because that's how most people uh, make their budgets. Um, and then on the right hand side, we can see um, a graph just showing you the top five uh, products uh, from 2015 to 2021. Um, and what you can see is that not only do these projects, uh, products, sorry, change over time, but also the proportion of the total number of CVEs that they take up changes over time. Um, so it is quite a kind of 
challenge um, to predict some of these and there are certain subsets that are uh, not going to be predictable and we knew that from the outset and part of this project was figuring out which um, types of CVEs could be predicted within a generic framework and which um, um, wouldn't be suited to that kind of approach. Um, so I think that next slide maybe please, um, unless you've got anything to add to that one, Aaron. Yeah, I will roll back just for a moment, just to say, you know, our goal was uncertainty reduction. And there's a lot of things you could predict when you hear the word predict or forecast, you might think like we were predicting that this particular organization was going to get exploited by this particular vulnerability. That's not something we can do. Maybe some others are looking at that research. We were just looking at the volume of CVEs that are coming out on a yearly basis or on a quarterly basis. There are a couple other great papers that framed that problem before. Um, and one of the challenges was that the data uh, from a time series forecasting perspective looked like three months might be the limit because of a kind of correlation effect in noise floor. Um, so that's why we were excited when we were able to do it for a slightly longer time frame. Um, but yeah, just reframing this as how can we use the data to see how many vulnerabilities will come out? Um, which one of the two models do you want to do, Matilda? I can talk about a Q theory model. So um, we looked at some of the metadata that is um, uh, you can download from NVD and also from MITRE, who are who are feeding into the NVD. But the the data um, they're producing is slightly different, and how we could uh, combine this information together with the total volume that you see over different time periods. Um, in order to do prediction. And there were a couple of uh, models we came up with that were inspired purely from this metadata. Um, so the first one um, I'm gonna talk about is a Q theory model. So um, every CVE has a date uh, that the entry was created in the database, uh, which is prior to the date that it was published. So this is a kind of leading indicator as to how many CVEs we might expect. And the problem we had then was how can we predict uh, when they get published? Um, and we use Little's Law, um, which is uh, designed to predict the size of the queue based on the arrival um, rate and the wait time um, and modified it slightly um, in order to fit our needs. So instead of figuring out the size of the queue, we wanted to estimate um, what is the rate at which um, items that enter the queue are exiting the queue. So this like small equation below is showing how we modified it. Um, so we looked at the probability that the wait time is gonna be less than the time that we're trying to predict ahead. Um, and this model was surprisingly successful at predicting long-term um, volumes of CVEs, uh, particularly up to, up to one year in advance. Um, and Aaron can talk about the other model we developed. The serial number prediction, yeah, and then just to cue you up for when I finish as well, maybe we can say a little bit more about what we use as a score for success, the, the prediction intervals and, and how we tested some of these things. But um, uh, Matilda is, of course, very professional, very uh, clean cut and describes her Q theory approach uh, in a very robust way. Um, I think of it a little bit like a wine cellar, right? You know the amount of wine bottles that are going in, you know the amount that first attendees drink then you can probably imagine the exit rate of bottles to the recycling um, bin. Um, and of course, if you have any of two of those parameters, you could, you could estimate the other ones, right? Like if you know how many bottles are being drunk and how many bottles are arriving, you could figure out how many are in the wine cellar. Or if you know how much is in the wine cellar and, and how many are being drunk, then you can figure out how quickly they must be arriving. Um, so that's the advantage of Q theory. And part of the reason that we, we use that approach was um, the first kind of breakthrough that we had was that the serial number prediction um, would allow us to extend past that three month window that I was telling you about. So you, you will show you in a little while some graphs of variance that'll explain why that three month um, challenge was a, was a hurdle. Um, but essentially serial number prediction is, um, it comes from, from history. There was a point in time where uh, the allies wanted to estimate the number of tanks that were being produced by the Axis in World War II. And they were um, capturing tanks and recording the serial numbers. And so the maths of this is really quite old. Um, but essentially what we do is we take the CVE year um, and the CVE ID and decompose it as a string. Um, many people 
think that the CVE year is the date of publication, but it's the date of assignment. And you can find that documented. I think Jay was actually one of the first people to point that out to me. But if you look at a lot of CVEs, you don't necessarily see that until you look at enough of them. And then you notice that um, it's the year of assignment. Um, and if you decompose that ID, then of course that's a serial number and you can look for the max of that ID. Um, and then you just have to correct for the number of observations, the number of publications that you've seen this year. And of course, there's some small difference from this um, serial number prediction and uh, the number that are actually published. Not everything that goes into the CVE pipeline gets published. So I think of this serial number prediction kind of like a lottery. So if you need a metaphor for describing this, the Q theory is the kind of uh, wine cellar version. The serial number prediction is kind of like if there was a lottery um, in a small town and you didn't know the population of the town, but you knew everyone bought a ticket, then each year that someone won, you could record the number. And some years that number would be higher than others. And as you extend that over time, you would start to get closer and closer to the, the population of that um, neighboring city. So kind of lottery prediction and, and wine cellar prediction um, are the metaphors I like to use because I'm not as professional as my colleague Matilda. Um, so maybe we should say a little bit more about how we tested these and their, their predictive value. Yeah, so um, we obviously have got two models here. Um, why do we have two models? Well, partly because there are two of us and we were arguing about it and um, that was the fun of doing this research. Um, but how could we figure out who was winning the ultimate battle of predicting the total number of CVEs? And we had to develop some kind of testing methodology um, and a straightforward validation we could use was just imagine that we're sometime in the past try and predict how many CVEs come out in the next year and then compare that to the real value and then uh, repeatedly do this over time to see how um, the models performed. And we called this kind of retrocasting back in time. And then the metric we used in order to um, benchmark the models against each other was the prediction interval at 95% confidence. So um, one model might predict um, 1,000 CVEs coming out in the next month or 20,000 coming out in the next year. And then with a plus or minus prediction interval of a thousand or 500. And in that case, we'd go with the model that uh, chose the prediction interval of 500 because it had had a better historic performance at, at getting the, the right value. Um, and so we analyzed a lot of models, not just these two, but we found that these two enhanced all of the machine learning models that we played with from that point on. Um, all right. So using that approach, um, Matilda? Yeah, so this is a little diagram on the left-hand side of the approach um, that I just described of a retrocasting. So um, we can't use the serial predictor or the queuing theory model for um, predicting subtypes of CVEs because even though we know the arrival date of the CVE beforehand, we don't know which uh, product it refers to necessarily. Um, so we do still have to use that volumetric um, historic data, uh, but we were able to use the indicators from the serial predictor and queuing theory as features into the machine learning models. Um, so the top graph of these three stacked on the left is showing um, how the models were performing historically um, when we trained like a few hundred of them uh, because machine learning models have many parameters and the best way to find the best one is just to have a go um, up for debate about that later. Um, and then uh, the next graph down shows when we refined out the best hyperparameter choices for each of the models against our statistic models. And then in the end, we, we uh, cut down to a single model and these orange bands here are showing the, the prediction interval around the historic prediction and then how far we had to kind of predict into the future um, what, one whole year later um, and then how well the true uh, prediction was against, against our interval. And then the right hand side just shows um, how we use this methodology to choose a different model each time because um, data changes over time. The way that uh, MITRE operates changes over time um, and therefore different models um, are different approaches are more or less appropriate at different points in time. And the black line is showing you the true number. And then the orange line is showing you what would happen if we just use last year's number, um, because that was the kind of straw man that we uh, needed to beat the kind of dummy model. So as you can see, um, this approach was, was beating um, 
you know, just taking the previous value and therefore we are making like some improvement on, on the baseline. Essentially, like if you know, if all of your models just predict the the mean of the previous two years, if you don't beat the mean, then you're not really using a predictor. So we set that as our like initial goal condition, and then each time we got a model that was better, we would set that as a new goal condition. So okay, this one has got a prediction interval that's you know, um, like a thousand, or this one's got a prediction interval that's two hundred or whatever. Um, and once we extended the the window out to a year, as you can see, we predicted. Uh, or the algorithms predicted that there would be 15,663 and there were 16,160. Um, and that's a repeatable sort of um, process. We were pretty happy because we think if you're trying to plan patching uh, over the coming year, that, that's good enough for most risk managers to work with. They can handle an uncertainty of plus or minus um, 5%. Um, and, and just to stress what Matilda was saying about the changing of the models, if you remember the serial number predictor and the um, queuing theory, one of the reasons, like when we first found the serial number prediction, that was great because that extended us beyond that kind of three month window. But, you know, we realized that if you predict in June, you're only predicting up until Christmas, right? So you're not really getting a year's prediction. And that's where we needed to turn to Little's Law um, to build uh, another model that it could extend over the, over the Christmas period. Um, but I think that that process is also illustrative of why we change models at different times of year and why some models perform different um, at different times of year. Um, so one of the challenges or one of the things that we really wanted to get across previous research has really focused on that three month window. And, and why did that exist? If you do a decomposition in time series analysis and you look at um, detrending and first order differencing of the time series, you would see something like the red line in the graph on the top right. Um, and basically that variance is really, really high. Um, and it makes it difficult to predict how many vulnerabilities will come out next month. Um, but when we looked at things on slightly larger timescales, like quarters um, or even years, then the variance reduces. So years is green in that graph up at the top. Um, and that means that you know, the serial number predictor that we found, when that extended the window um, up to a year, it, it became very obvious to us that we could get a lower variance and a higher accuracy by looking at a longer time window. And I personally have never seen a, a, a problem like that in forecasting that was easier to predict, um, or, or you were more accurate in your yearly predictions than you might be in your monthly. Um, but that's what happened here. Anything I've left out, Matilda? No, all good. Okay. Um, so, you know, you can see that we can predict uh, a volume of products within a reasonable accuracy that patch managers might use or, or other risk professionals uh, might use for a variety of different reasons. Um, I do want to point out, you know, having come from an ICS and SCADA background, sometimes you want to air gap things, you want to isolate things, or you can't patch them. So it's not just useful for figuring out how big should my patch team ne be next year. It's also useful for questions like, if I don't patch this thing for two years, how many vulnerabilities might I see in that time period? Um, but getting back to this core point, like why can't we do all the products? Not all the products decompose um, in, the, in the correct way to be able to use these same approaches. Uh, as Matilda said, we can't use the serial number predictor on this because we're doing subsets of the total number. Um, there might be some work that could be done there in the future by others. If you knew the top and the bottom of the CVE IDs for a certain product. Um, but the main reasons are that sample sizes are too small. For some vulnerabilities, we've never seen them before. There's only five of them. We can't do a lot of statistical analysis. Also different patch release cadences. So when you try and match correlation for uh, Oracle, for example, products, that's three months in the past because they patch on a quarterly basis instead of a monthly. Um, so it can't be detrended doesn't pass an augmented Dickey-Fuller test. And it might be predictable, but the uncertainty is too high. The good news is about 48 products do have potential for volume forecasting in these ways. Um, and we'd love to work on some other things um, such as, can you predict the CVSS score? Um, turns out that's highly dependent on the product. Um, it's also highly dependent on type. Type is particular challenge because it's mostly written up in natural language uh, forms. Um, for example, a cross-site scripting vulnerability might not be appropriate in certain programming languages or certain products. So even though it makes up, you know, 12% or something of all CVEs, that doesn't mean it would be 12% of the given random CVE that you're thinking about. Um, so on the right, we have one of our, one of our predictions. And um, Matilda, do you want to say anything more about this particular slide before I go on? Well, 
no, I think I'm conscious of time and I want to hear, okay. you know, make sure we hear from the rest of the panel. And um, this is just our kind of forecast um, taken like back last year um, against the kind of mean of the last two years. And yeah, please come and ask us about it. Thank you. Yeah. I'll say a little bit more about the graph on the left and then I'm keen to hand over to everybody else as well, but that's the accuracy graph. So you can see the graph on the left is kind of a longer time view of what on the right is a snapshot in time. On the left is kind of how did it perform? And the dotted lines are our predictions. And then the uh, solid colored lines are um, the actual results. And the reason there are shorter ones down below is that's the, that's the one year prediction, the six months, the three month, and the one month. Um, and that's why they're different lengths. But that's us. And um, I want to remind you that our presentation uh, today was was research that was really inspired by the next two pieces you see. So if you imagine, uh, you know, 1600 vulnerabilities are coming out next year, how would you know which ones we're gonna get exploits? And with that, I'll hand over to Jay and Sasha. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, next slide. So this is, so EPSS, Exploit Prediction Scoring Systems. This is an effort um, born out of a lot of work uh, by Jay and, and colleagues at Kenneth Security, um, which is intended to fill a gap in the industry. So we have many problems as practitioners and researchers in the information security field. Um, one of which, a big one, is prioritizing which vulnerabilities to patch. Uh, there are existing standards and efforts and strategies that everyone knows about. Um, based on you know current uh, scoring systems and certainly idiosyncratic behaviors of the firm and whatever. But what we don't know, what we haven't been able to create as a capability is an understanding of um, which how the threat landscape is changing and which vulnerabilities actually are being exploited in the wild. And that's what this effort is trying to do. It's a standards group now, an emerging standard uh, under FIRST. Um, and in addition to predicting which vulnerabilities will be exploited um, on a score from you know, zero to one, zero to hundred percent, we would also very much like the long-term goal of this is to be able to understand that threat landscape and hopefully be able to explain the threat landscape, explain why certain vulnerabilities are being exploited relatively more um, uh, than other vulnerabilities. So that's our, that's our long-term goal. But there's lots of work, of course, uh, that we need to do in order to get there. Uh, next slide. And the next bunch of slides, I think Jay will take you to through the uh, the model. Sure. So um, this is some research that uh, my company did with Kenna, uh, where we're looking at remediation timelines and the amount of remediation going on. And so each point on this plot is a, an organization uh, doing vulnerability scanning and remediation over time. And this is over about a two year period. And what's interesting is that across the horizontal, across the X axis, we're seeing how many open vulnerabilities are seen per month on average across this two year window. And then on the vertical, we're seeing how many did they close per month? And what's interesting is that there's that red line is about 10%. Um, the red line is doing a, a best fit here. And so given all of the vulnerabilities that companies have across their network, and you can see in the upper right, gets over 10 million. Um, and those, about 10% of those are being remediated every month. And so the question is, which 10%? You know, and that's the huge challenge, I think, that organizations face. How do they, how do they decide what to fix and what needs to be delayed? Because they're not getting 100% closure rate every month. They're not even close. They're about, you know, 5 to 20% in there. Next slide, please. And so the the main thing that we want to grab to to try and solve this prioritization challenge is data, trying to get at the data to understand what's going on, what are the attributes of these vulnerabilities, um, and how do they help us try to understand which are being attacked and which aren't. And by the way, that's what we're focusing. We're focusing on exploitation activity. Um, and if you're if you're trying to make a full decision, uh, typically based around risk or perhaps time commitment, cost, that sort of thing, we're looking at a small part of that that sort of traditional risk equation. We're only looking at the threat here. And so, as you're trying to make a decision, you want to take 
the thing we're doing here at EPSS, along with a whole bunch of other things in your environment, the data, the asset, all this stuff. Um, but this is looking at our data architecture. So a lot of the things that we're focusing on right now is sort of to the top of this, where we're looking at getting data to, to correlate and enrich, bring all that data together. And of course, the best way to do that is with a CVE ID. So with all of these disparate vendors and all these data sources, everybody hopefully is tracking the CVE ID and we can start to bring in things like exploitation activity or exploit creation, publishing of exploit code, trying to bring that in and correlate it and bring it all into essentially talking about the same vulnerability. Then from all of that data, we're gonna do feature extraction. We're gonna try and extract what variables are gonna be helpful. You know, is that the, the CWE information, the CP information? How do we bring out that information to, to make it accessible to a model and hopefully make it meaningful? And then we're gonna do some tweaking of that and some tuning of the model and model generation. We went through this for the first EPSS and we're in the process of going through it for the next version, which hopefully is gonna be a lot better, faster, stronger, all that good stuff. Um, and those data sources are on the right, um, sort of the typical uh, sort of sets of data sources. The, the interesting thing is on the exploit activity side, we're working with Fortinet and we're working with um, Alien Vault, Proofpoint, several other companies, especially through Kenna Security, to try and understand what is going on in that attacker sphere. What, what are the, the threat capabilities? What are they going after? What is the activity around exploitation in the wild? which I think is, is really what's gonna set this apart. Next slide, please. And when we did the first one, we had a couple of requirements that we're dropping for the second one. One of them is that it had to be very easy to implement. When we were designing the first one, we thought people are gonna to wanna to do this in Excel. You know, We had no notion of a centralized system. For EPSS version two, we're going to a centralized system with API so that nobody has to go out and gather data or rate things or fill in questions or anything. They're just gonna get a score from a centralized API and or just downloading all the scores. So the first model though, we tried to limit it, limit the number of variables to things that were objective, easy to grab, all this good stuff. And we came up with these 16 variables. And the model is on the left. You can see the, the weights that were derived from the data. Uh, and then sort of a visual representation of those weights with the dashed line and the, and the vertical there talking about um, things on the right are contributing to the probability of exploitation. Things on the left are going to detract from that. And then the width of those uh, distributions are sort of talking about the confidence around that score. Um, and when we take a score, we're just grabbing the, the central point of those curves. And then we're putting in that in that formula and getting out the probability of exploitation within the first 12 months. And that's what we trained this to. And that's another thing we hope to, to shift with V2 about what we're actually trying to predict. Next slide, please. These are two curves. Um, if you haven't seen these before, um, they're a little complex, um, but if you've seen them before, they're really helpful. Um, as you've, as you've seen a lot of these, they become a little bit more intuitive, but the one on the left is a rock curve and we're trying to push the line into the upper left. And one of the things that we wanted to make sure EPSS was doing is that it was better than what people are doing now. And so we compared it to CVSS. And so that left one, we're trying to push that line into the upper left. If that line went straight up and straight over, it would be a perfect model. Uh, it is not. Uh, and so we've got room to expand and to get better. But you can see the, the CVSS line if we, and this is a continuous line because we're outputting between zero and one or as, as Sasha said, zero and 100%. So if you start at 100% and go down, you're gonna start in that lower left corner and go to the upper right corner. Depending on where you are, you're gonna change your false positive rate. So if you fix everything above 60% and above, you're gonna be you know, with a low false positive rate and sort of a low true positive rate. But as you go up, you're gonna increase your false positive rate and your true positive rate. And same thing with, with uh, CVSS uh, score, as you lower your threshold for remediating, you're gonna go higher in the false positive rate and higher in the true positive rate. And so you can see in the left one, we're, we're exceeding what, you, what CVSS is capable of predicting as far as exploitation activity. The one on the right, precision recall curve, um, we relabel these in a lot of the papers we've done about efficiency and coverage. It's 
the vertical is about how efficient the things that you remediate, how efficient is that? And when you start on a high score, you're starting on the left side of that. And this one we're trying to push to the upper right. So you can see we've got a lot of room on this particular metric, set of metrics to go and improve. Um, but as you start on a high score, you're going to have a very high efficiency and a low amount of coverage. And coverage is out of everything that you should be remediating, what percent are you actually remediating with your decision uh, approach here? And so you can see CVSS is, is quite low on this one, not very efficient. Um, and that's something we talk about in a lot of our research about comparing the efficiency. And really what you're going to get from EPSS is that you, you probably will have to attack and go after less, remediate less, uh, and be more efficient in your, in your approach. Um, and so as we look at V2, we're going to be pushing the, the left one to the upper left and the right plot to the upper right. Next slide, please. To try and evaluate performance, the, the slide we just looked at was one way to look at the performance. This is another way. We're talking about the predicted probability, and so the, the plot on the left is a calibration plot. Um, and essentially, when people say, hey, you know, you, predict this, you predicted this one to be a 20%, and uh, it was exploited, so you're totally wrong. And that is not at all what probability is all about. It's when we say 20%, 20% of everything we say is 20% is probably going to be exploited. And that's the way that probability works. And so this plot is saying, hey, when we're talking, you know, 60%, we expect 60% of those to be exploited and so on and so forth. So when you see something rated at 1%, and there are a lot of things rated less than 1% here because it's very heavy tailed, um, what we see is about 1% of those rated 1% are probably going to be exploited, that this calibration curve is, is pretty closely following what we would expect, that dashed line on the left. The one on the right is just a, a quick sort of density plot looking at the distribution of vulnerabilities that are rated uh, high or low and where they actually observe to be exploited or not exploited. And you can see that red density uh, is definitely more to the right. The not exploited is definitely more to the left. And there are some that overlap. There are some that are rated very low that are exploited. And there are some that are rated very high that are not exploited. And this is not a perfect model, but we're trying to improve. We're trying to do better than what is out there currently. And that's really the key here. We're just trying to make things better. And hopefully with V2, we're going to make it even better. And, and V3, again, keep on improving. Um, and so a lot of that is going to be driven by the data we have available and all the work that we're putting into uh, constructing these models and tuning them and, and making them performant. Next slide, please. And I think here I'll turn it over to Sasha to talk about uh, the relationship between EPSS and CVSS. So this is the last slide that we have, but let me take a couple minutes before um, uh, uh, Luca's great work. Um, so this is either a very powerful slide or a, a highly contentious one, depending on your, your views and biases. Um, what this represents is, is an illustration of, as Jay mentioned, the relationship between CVSS and EPSS. And if you believe that CVSS is a measure of severity of vulnerability, it's a composite of a bunch of different things, but, if, um, but in addition, a measure of severity and EPS is, EPSS is a measure of probability of likelihood the vulnerability exploited. What you have is this kind of familiar sort of risk curve now, or this risk graph, this risk matrix. Now, it's not, you know, entirely uh, exhaustive of all risk issues, um, certainly, but it does capture these two. And what it enables you to do, what these two standards will enable you to do is to plot each of the vulnerabilities and groups of vulnerabilities on a figure like this. And what you see, first of all, is a lot of the mass centered on the bottom of the, um, of the figure, suggesting uh, that, that it's not only true, that it's not exclusively true that attackers are going after um, high severity vulnerabilities, that they're exploiting high severity vulnerabilities. Um, uh, moreover, most vulnerabilities are not being exploited, right? I think this has come to be, to be known to be true through different um, uh, research efforts. 5%, give or take, of all vulnerabilities are being exploited. So what you see on the bottom axis, on the x-axis, CVSS score is from 0 to 10, uh, EPSS from zero to one or hundred percent. So the stuff in the top right, we would argue represents those vulnerabilities that could lead to a full compromise of a system being exploited from anywhere in, um, in the internet and have a high probability of being exploited. The stuff in the bottom left, not so much. And you can figure out there may be different strategies for an organization 
to interpret and respond and remediate these different vulnerabilities. Um, but what would I would what I would argue is that this this is a very powerful figure because it provides a very nice illustration of of potential strategies for for enterprises uh, in addressing these different vulnerabilities. Um, something that I would add has never been possible before because we didn't really have a good understanding of the exploitability of any of these vulnerabilities. Um, so you could do this on a um, uh, on an organizational level. You could do it on a wider enterprise level across um, across offices, or even on a national level or international level. Right? You filter out those vulnerabilities that you don't care about. Um, there's a lot more to digest here, and happy to take questions on it. Um, uh, but I'll stop there. The, la the final effort or the final point I'll make about EPSS, again, it's an open standard. Anyone is welcome to participate. We have bi-weekly meetings and the data, the actual exploit data are now available uh, and posted for anyone to go download on the first site. So I'll leave that. And uh, I just will also want to add on, if you notice uh, in the lower right, there's a URL there at first.org. Uh, this plot and several others are being generated uh, I'll say mostly on a daily basis. Um, and so like this this particular plot, uh, we have it sort of picking out 10, 10 random CVEs and showing where they are on here. And so it changes daily as you look at it. But we've got other plots looking at, you know, recent uh, CVEs that are published and the scores that they have and things that change over time because sometimes the CPE data gets updated a week after it's published or something like that. And so the real time stats are there. And as Sasha mentioned, the data are out there too, uh, that you can go and download on a daily basis. And I should point out that we're in the um, make it work stage. And so we're, we're in that first stage of trying to make things work. So like if you go there right now, I think uh, last updated was Sunday. Uh, and so after we get off here, I'm gonna go run it again for today. But um, we're still working on the back end process of all the data. So there might be a delay sometimes in a day or two but uh, most of the most of this should be current on a daily basis, and so we're going to move into the next stage of making it uh, making it work well uh, in the next stage. So, thank you. All right, we'll take it over to Luca. So you you've got a sense of how many vulnerabilities might be coming next year. You've got a sense of how likely are those vulnerabilities to have uh, an exploit written for them. And Luca had done this great work and continues to do great work on how often will it be exploited. So Luca, um, take it away. Yeah, sure. Thank you, and hello everybody. So um, this this part of the work uh, we call it the details of vulnerability exploitation in the sense that. Uh, it reflects the fact that uh, it is now empirically very well known that um, frequency of exploitation is not uniformly distributed among vulnerabilities. And uh, this part of the work that I'm gonna talk you through in the next uh, so 10 minutes uh, is going to sort of try to dig up a little bit of the reasons why and what other factors apart from the pure, as we've seen so far with the vulnerability prediction models and with EPSS, so apart from the vulnerability data that these models can use to tell you whether an exploit is likely or not, what other factors are at play? And for us, it really all started some time ago uh, now. This is a picture from 2014. Uh, for each of these slides, I will have the paper where all the sort of mathematics and uh, nitty gritty technical details of all the models and stuff are, are reported much more rigorously than what I want to bother you with uh, today. So I will try to give you the gist. Uh, and this picture kind of does the job decently. I actually find myself to go back to this picture quite often. Uh, it started all from a very simple question, and that is uh, what instruments do we as the defenders have to decide whether when a new vulnerability is out, we should be worried or not? or at least not quite yet, yeah? And so we thought, well, let's see what happens if we make like a Venn diagram, right? Of the universe of vulnerabilities, that is the old wounds uh, square that you see there, vulnerabilities with a proof of concept exploit in the top left of the, of the diagram, uh, vulnerabilities that have a recorded exploit in the wild so that somebody said, well, at least one exploit of this thing has been det detected at scale, uh, on the internet and uh, the exploits that uh, are traded in underground markets. And here in particular is some of the more prominent 
underground markets operating in the, in the Russian space. And well, if one looks at this, and here, of course, areas are proportional to number of vulnerabilities, so two, two uh, insights come up, uh, and they're very, very much in line, of course, with what uh, Sasha was just saying before with the last uh, picture, but also with the rest of the sense of this panel. And that is that the answer to uh, the first question that is, is there a new vulnerability? Should I worry? Well, the answer is most likely not. And uh, the second question one may ask is, well, yeah, but it has a very high CWSS score. Should, should I be worried now? And the answer is, well, not really, not necessarily, right? And this now is part of the, of the common understanding of uh, uh, what are the limits of vulnerability matrix we currently have. And indeed, CWSS has never made the promise of being a risk matrix. Um, not since when at least this discourse is developed enough. Um, yet, of course, it's still the, stay, uh, the, the standard de facto, but here, if you look at it very simply, and then again, the more rigorous analysis is in the paper, but if you were to just patch all the red vulnerabilities here, you're gonna end up do a whole lot of work that you shouldn't be doing, patching vulnerabilities that don't have an exploit. And you will also miss a whole lot of vulnerabilities that do have an exploit, right? So uh, they wouldn't work, they wouldn't work wonders for you. Um, but then again, this is very preliminary and is only looking at presence of exploit or no presence of exploit in terms of evidence. Yeah. It doesn't really tell you how much, how frequently a certain exploit would be used or uh, whether the distribution is somewhat uniform across exploits. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, and so this is where the, the sort of the heavy tails of exploitation come into place, because if you zoom in into only the exploited vulnerabilities, so this is not all CVEs, these are CVEs for which an exploit has been reported in the wild, and you look at the distribution of the frequency of attacks against uh, uh, these different CVEs, and here I present a view uh, split over different software types, and you see that there is a, I mean, a hugely skewed distribution there, uh, whereas uh, whereby a very, very small fraction of vulnerabilities carry a disproportionate amount of risk with respect to all the other vulnerabilities, even though those other vulnerabilities do have an exploit. Uh, so the numbers are staggering, right? I mean, if you, if you look in, uh, in uh, the worst case, you could have up to 5% of the vulnerabilities for which an exploit in the wild exists, carrying up to 95% of the attacks. And this is roughly true for Windows, for pro productivity uh, software, that is Office platforms and so on. Browser software, it speaks for itself. For plugin, it's a slightly different story, but once you actually dig into the data, you see that if you differentiate all the, the reason why the curve is uh, moved more toward the, the, the um, equality line there uh, is really because uh, that trend is driven by uh, Java. And uh, um, the whole difference stays in the pre-Oracle and the post-Oracle, let's say, um, division of Java. So when Java was still some microsystem, up until 2009, this rule was not true. Once uh, uh, there is the switch over to, 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 to Oracle Java, this becomes true. Well, the reason probably lays in the fact that people that were deploying the Sun as the, the Sun's version of, of Java were uh, delaying uh, moving over to, to the Oracle version. And this created this effect whereby certain vulnerabilities remained around for much longer and created this effect. But the bottom line of this is that clearly there is a strong, strong skew with respect to what attackers are actually doing with vulnerabilities that simply looking at CVEs and that we, as we saw before, also by simply looking at success scores is not gonna tell you. Um, and what is also a bit impressive perhaps from this is that, so this comes from data that comes from millions of hosts worldwide, right? And uh, it spans uh, um, several years of observation. Um, so what you would expect there is that uh, there is some kind of oscillation, maybe some vulnerabilities go up and then they're replaced by another one. Even if they carry the vast majority of, uh, of attacks, you wouldn't expect such a small fraction to remain responsible for the vast majority of attacks for such a long period of time. 
this tells us something, right? Because if attackers were actually reacting so quickly at the introduction of a new vulnerability and immediately exploit them at scale, then this plot here, these data would make no sense. So obviously that explanation doesn't, doesn't match reality and, and we need to find a better one. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is what fo follow-up work uh, tried to do in that direction, is really trying to ask uh, how often does the threat scenario change when you look at vulnerability exploitation? And again, uh, the paper is, is, in, is in the footnote there and you will find lots of um, very detailed uh, models that explain the data, uh, both from a, from a more foundational, but also more empirical way. Um, and, uh, uh, but this graph again, sort of sums up uh, the intuition behind it. And what you see here is how much time on the X axis it has to pass for a new attack against a certain type of software is more likely to arrive again on one of your systems uh, than an attack that you have already seen in the past. So essentially it tells you for how long uh, the attackers are gonna keep using and using and using again, the same vulnerability, attacking the same kind of software before they have to switch over to a new vulnerability uh, that, um, that will replace the previous one. And if you look at the timeline there, uh, we're talking of almost three years. So it takes three years for attackers to change their attack portfolio to a degree enough for a switch in the likelihood of you getting a new exploit as opposed to an older one against the software platform that you still have deployed. Uh, and the time that passes in there is almost 800 days. So this clearly is completely incompatible with, with the idea that every new CDE that is out there must be patched immediately, because at least when you look at attack at mass, uh, obviously attackers are not behaving like that. And having a defensive model that is completely disassociated from that uh, simply makes no sense, uh, if nothing else, because that model generates data that is as extreme as the one that we've been showing you today and throughout the whole presentation really, including uh, the work from Sasha, Jay, and uh, Matilda and Aaron. Um, so the question is, what is it that we can do to try to figure out what is it that these attackers are trying to do, at least when we look at attacks at mass? This is where the next slide uh, comes in handy. Uh, and so what we've been doing and is really trying to figure out and to sort of reverse engineer a little bit the, the, the attack economics that are behind uh, exploit innovation and threat innovation by attackers themselves and see whether these intuitions on top of the vulnerability data that we already are aware of, including CYSS and severity scores and whatnot, can add more information to how we actually go about predicting uh, whether, uh, whether a vulnerability will be exploited and possibly also to what extent. And so we've been doing this by looking, and this is something that we here at UE are now, me and my group are, are have delved into quite a bit and, and uh, uh, in the direction particularly of finding out what are the reference communities and what, are the, what is the kind of threat intelligence that you want to look at, or at least the sources of the threat intelligence you want to look at to have credible information about uh, whether a vulnerability carries significant risk or represents that noise that we have characterized for the, for, for, for the past uh, 40 minutes now. And here are two examples of these data sources, one on the left hand side, one very common, very famous underground market where uh, they, they, they sell everything from, uh, from, from, from drugs uh, to, to vulnerability exploits and malware. Uh, but there you find some kind of uh, threat uh, that is not really technologically interesting in the sense that it doesn't really tell you much about the actual innovation that the attackers put in place. So to give you an example, there you would be buying for $6 on the left hand, uh, on the left hand side of this slide. For $6, you would be buying a PDF manual of how to deploy the Zeus botnet that is also, you know, and, and the bot and the Zeus malware is available on GitHub for you to download freely. 
On the right hand side is a more prominent Russian underground market where they actually sell some of the um, some of the more prominent um, attacks that we've been uh, that we've been looking at. And once you start diving into that data, uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, once you start diving into that data, um, yes, um, and you look at the numbers again. All the the, the paper evolves in depth uh, into into the into the different statistics. And here I only present you the uh, the um, threat innovation, the ones that are relevant to threat innovation. And if you look on the left hand side, I give you a count of how many new vulnerability exploits come up into these markets uh, per year. And you see that the pace at which they arrive is not very, very high. Um, but on the right hand side, I provide you uh, with, the, uh, with some breakdown by software vendor uh, of the time that passes in between uh, uh, the market starts demanding a new uh, vulnerability exploit that will substitute the ones that is already being traded into that market or the ones that are already being traded into that market. And if you just look at the, at, at this, at the scale of the x-axis of the right-hand side plot, uh, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, and you look at that and you compare it. No, no, the previous one, the one with the animation. Sorry about that. Yeah, that was the trick. Um, the, uh, if you look at the, uh, at the, simply at the time scale there, you see that there is a staggering match between uh, what attacker economics can tell us about threat innovation and what you can actually go about measuring in the wild. So now, next slide. And with this, I will conclude. Uh, uh, so the idea is really that we can factor these things together. Uh, I think that uh, with what uh, um, we've been presenting so far, you may be convinced that vulnerability data is already extremely important to make uh, to move toward more quantitative assessments of risk. But once we're actually able of figuring out more about the attacker behavior, particularly in relation to attacks at scale, then we can actually build quantitative measurements of, uh, uh, of vulnerability exploitation. On the left-hand side there, you see the relations. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you click the button uh, area, will, um, an image will appear uh, that is perhaps more meaningful that, than just the, the the table per se. Uh, but the, what this simply tells you is that there is a very clear relationship between attacker economics and the behavior of uh, mass attackers with respect to uh, uh, our ability to predict whether a vulnerability is going to be exploited in the wild. And if we start plugging this into an actual quantitative framework, and this is the, the plot on the right hand side that comes from another study, um, and we start looking at insights from these considerations and plugging them into our risk functions, then we can actually derive quantitative risk assessment methods that are moving finally away from simply having experts that tell you, yeah, I think this vulnerability is going to be very bad. You should patch it immediately to actually evidence-based uh, risk matrix that can tell you on a vulnerability by vulnerability basis, and as a function of time uh, and of your system, uh, what the actual risk realistically uh, could be. Again, in the framework of mass attackers or, or um, attacks against, uh, against the mass of internet users. Uh, with this, I will wrap up. I don't know how we did with, with time, but um, uh, I think, Arian, we're happy that uh, we had that extra half an hour. Absolutely, yes. And thank you again, all of you, for joining me in this presentation. To the audience, um, if you're anything like me, your head is probably swimming with this. I hope that the number one takeaway from all of this great research is that the attackers can be predicted to some degree. And so there is hope, you know, there's this overwhelming story in our industry that defenders just have to react and they can't predict, they can't forecast. They're always on the run and they're exhausted. But I think we've just shown you three excellent stories of hope 
about how in the future you might be able to do less work and better defense uh, all at the same time. So with that, we will be taking questions inside the Work Adventure app. Um, I hope you'll join us in two-bit space to um, give us questions. Uh, and thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I know that you're all busy people. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to these fantastic researchers. So um, yeah, see you in the questions. Thank you very much, Aaron. And thank you so much, all of you, for indeed three very inspirational stories on how we can do security better.